السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد I'm very happy to be here with everybody in Hong Kong and since I'm, Hong I'm in Hong Kong I'm going to pretend that I like pandas because I understand there's certain things you don't say you don't like when you're in Hong Kong I will assume pandas are one of them Bruce Lee is another one <laughs> right so okay very good um, I just want to know uh, who's in the audience so who's from the Philippines in here let's see some hands Allahu Akbar the Philippines yes sir Kumustaka Tang pangalong ko Kamal Makki and that's it we're finished khalas and the start wonderful who's from India in here Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar mashallah Pakistan oh ho ho look at that yes salam uh, so we can do the lecture in, in Urdu if you like kya aap chahte hain ke Urdu mein angrezi mein bolun ha bas mazak kar raha hota Urdu thoda thoda don't speak Urdu. Yeah? Very good, very good. I, I lived in Islamabad for five years, but we were just little kids, so all I learned was Kutta Bandar Billy, and that was about it. Yeah? Wonderful. Uh, who's from Africa? Too many countries in Africa. Let's just see the African, my brothers. My brothers from Africa. MashaAllah. Notice also some brown people put their hands up. So, Indian origin lived in Africa. And some white people put their hands up. It works, alhamdulillah. Okay, what countries do we, did we not mention here? Okay, who's. Who is from, he was a local from here, originally, born and raised, from Hong Kong. Yes, sir, excellent. From China, mainland, yeah. Nobody? Okay, fine, fine. Anybody else, any, any place I didn't mention? Indonesia, yes, Indonesia, let me see Indonesia. MashaAllah, fantastic, excellent, excellent. Bangladesh, Allahu Akbar. Now, what else do we have, UK? UK, wonderful, wonderful. All right. Anything else? U.S. Nobody said anything. Huh? <laughs> Boo. <laughs> okay, mashallah, yes. Sheikh Abdul Bari from Seattle. I'm from Virginia. So that's U.S. representing. Wonderful. Okay, okay. Halas, we'll get started. Welcome to everybody else as well. Um, yeah, the difficulty of being different. So a lot happens to you psychologically. When you're a minority that lives amongst the majority, a number of things happen. And you are faced with a number of choices. And there are actually four choices, and you have to pick one of them. So if you're a minority that lives, lives amongst the majority, the first option might be to leave whatever values you, you originally had or you have religiously. So that means a Muslim, let's say, living as a minority amongst non-Muslims. One option they have is to push away all Islamic values. Or even if it's culture, whatever it is their parents culture they push it aside and they completely adopt the values and the culture of the majority that's the first option very logically the second option is the opposite of that that you completely reject and refuse the values of the majority and you stick hard and you stay hard against uh, upon the values of let's say your your place of origin or of your religion that's the second one the third option is to reject both and you see that happening sometimes that uh, for example in America you'll find someone who will reject the, the Islamic, his Islamic values, push them aside and the values of the majority of people and then pick another subculture in the community whatever it is you know there are many subcultures in communities you know wh whatever it is it could be related to music like a, the goth or punk culture or something like that the fourth one now and this is probably the most reasonable and this is the one that we would like is that you make a mix of both cultures or both values. And this is only, um, it's logical and it's, it's the one that be makes best religious sense. Meaning, you're a Muslim who lives, for example, I'm gonna pick America as an example, a Muslim living in America. So I'm going to adhere to my Islamic values. And anything from the values of the majority that goes against Islamic values, I'm going to reject. But at the same time, as a human being, you can't help but be a part of that community. You know, you don't find, for example, a man born and raised in America speaking with a British accent. That would be, where would he get that from? He picks up the accent that he's around because this is how we are as humans. You know, we're very social beings. So we pick up from each other. So it's not necessary that you have to reject everything, every value of the majority. It, you can't do that. And not everything of, of, in, 
in your society and in your locality is evil and bad. Some people think to be a Muslim, you have to reject everything that's not Islamic. Allah, and I know people like this, even sciences, they reject it. This is the work of the kuffar. It's science, man. Work of the kuffar. You're going to bring it in here also? Keep your problems over there. Everything, mathematics, or kuffar. Okay, you don't use math in your life? So it's not, <laughs> that's not a requirement in the religion. We reject everything that comes from the, the, the society. No, you make a blend and you take the best. You, can, you take the best of what you have in your community, in your society. And at the same time, your core values, you identify yourself as a Muslim in that society. So these are the four options that we're faced with now. Now, any minority living amongst a majority feels the pressure to conform, the pressure to be like everybody else. Now, this pressure is caused by a number of things. Number one, human beings, as I said, we're social beings. We interact and we are affected by each other socially. Interestingly, animals who do not communicate at an intricate level like we do, animals are affected, you know, they affect each other. And there are many examples of this, actually. Um, there was a, a dog, this is in America, there was a dog who only lived with humans and he never ever saw another dog in his life. So he thought he was a human and he would actually stand up on his hind legs trying to be like everyone else. I'm not talking about Scooby-Doo, by the way. <laughs> he does that too. <laughs> yeah? Um, actually, just uh, two days ago, I saw uh, something about a dog raised with cats and he thought he was a cat and he sits like a cat. Dogs sit with their arms out like this, with their legs out, but cats bend them in. This dog, they had a picture of him sitting like a cat like this. I saw another video of a dog who thought he was a cat. And there's a, there's a plant called catnip. It's from the mint family. And when cats smell that, they start to roll around and get all high and lazy and everything. But it doesn't affect dogs. But this dog would smell it and he would roll around also like the cats. So animals, they don't communicate on a very intricate high level. They affect each other. What about humans then? For sure we're going to be affected by each other. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ told us about this. He told us also about your close companions. You, know, be, you should look and see who your close companions are. Because you take their deen, meaning their deen, their conduct, their values, they will affect you. So naturally, without anything, without anyone telling you, be like us, you naturally feel the pressure to conform to be like everybody else. And that's why also people feel comfortable when they find someone else who's on the same wavelength as they are or from the same origin as they are. You feel immediately comfortable. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that naturally every society believes that their way is the best way. Their values are the best values. And every country you go to, they believe they're the best and they see the, the people next to us, oh, those people. Always, wherever you go. Yeah, sometimes when I travel to a place, I ask them, who do you guys not like? Who don't you like in here? And one group was, oh, the Germans. In America, the French, you know, every group has a place and there's some community that they think they're beneath us. But naturally, every group thinks they're the best and their culture is the best. This is known as ethnocentrism, ethnocentrism, when it's the belief, the inherent belief that or the, or the belief that your values are inherently better than all the other values and all the other cultures out there. And right now, those people who are from Pakistan in the audience originally, they believe, yes, our culture, our way is better than the Afghan way. And the Afghan thinks well, our way is the best way. And the Filipinos are sitting here. Filipinos are better than everyone else. And they're right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sorry. Everybody feels that way about their people. Everybody feels our culture is the best way. Our way is the best way. Our language is the best way. That's natural. Every community experiences this. Now, the thing that's uh, the important factor here is that when you're a minority living amongst that majority, you also start to believe that their way is the best way. And not only that, it transcends that. It goes to, to countries. When there's a strong nation, the weaker nations start to believe that the way of the strong nation is the best way. And this has happened many times historically. In Spain, when the Muslims were in charge of Spain, the young Spanish youth, they were not Muslim, but they would dress like the Muslims and act like the Muslims. You can just imagine this young Spanish man who's not even a Muslim. He's like got a turban on, he's got a miswak on, he's walking around, mm, yes, alhamdulillah. Mm. He's not even a Muslim, right? Because the Muslims were the dominant force and the minorities always want to, they think that way is the best way and they want to act like that. And that's why, same thing happens now with, with in America basically. Our number one export is 
pop culture, popular culture, movies, music, things like that. So you'll find people all around the world trying to act like someone who lives in the ghettos of America. Like Allah saved you from the ghettos. You want to you wanna live like I'm, you're in the ghettos. Yeah? You see this all over, in Germany even. There's people in Germany and they want to live like they're in a very dangerous neighborhood in America. The people in the dangerous neighborhood, in America, they make dua every day, Allah take me out of here. And the people in other parts of the world, I wish I could be in the ghetto of America. Okay. You see this all over the world. And in, in Sudan, I, was, I went outside of the, the, the capital and I saw some very poor villages. And I found someone spray painting on the broken wall, some rapper name. I'm like, really? <laughs> this is your concern? Look at this village. That's your concern, this rapper? <laughs> Fix this village, man. The wall's broken, you're spraying. I fixed the wall. So what happens is nations then, they start to see the way of the strong nations as the best way. You will find this now. Muslims will question Islamic values and they'll say, why don't we have those values? Why don't we have American values? Why don't we have Western values? Because those nations are strong. So there's more pressure then to conform to be like the majority. I'll tell you something interesting concerning ethnocentrism and, and da'wah, for example. One of our mashayikh, uh, Sheikh Ja'far Idris, and he said that many years ago he was in Czechoslovakia. What used to be Czechoslovakia, it doesn't exist anymore. But he said I was at an event and I didn't like the gathering and I wanted to leave. So I started walking, looking for the hotel and I got lost. He said I asked a Czech lady for directions to the hotel. And basically in English all you have to do is say the name of the hotel and she immediately understood. But she gave him directions in full Czech. Go straight, make a left, make a right, you'll find this and make another. He didn't understand a single word, of course. He said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. She repeated it again, just slower. That doesn't help, right? <laughs> I'm just going to say it slowly. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. If I don't speak Mandarin, you can say it as slowly as you want. I still don't understand. By the way, just as a note, same thing happens when people ask the shiuch questions, yeah? or they ask the instructor questions. People come up to me, they ask me a question, Islamic question. It's too difficult for me, and I don't, understand, I don't know the answer. So I tell them, um, I don't know the answer. I, I don't know, Allah Alam. So they say it again slowly. <laughs> like, like I'm slow or something, huh? Uh, oh, oh, ah, ah. Now that you're speaking slowly, now I know the hadith said, <laughs> I still don't know it. You can say it as slow or fast as you want. I still don't know it. So this lady is just repeating herself again slowly. So the sheikh tells her one more time, I'm sorry, I don't understand. He said, she hit me and walked away. Why did she do that? Because she thought he was dumb. You don't understand? What's the matter with you? I explained to you very nicely and I even explained it slowly. Why don't you speak Czech? Why don't you speak my language? And many people do this to minorities. You should speak my language. In America we do this to people all the time. And we, we get arrogant about it. If you don't speak the language, get out. How welcoming, isn't it? Yeah? You have to speak my language. It's the language. And every other place thinks their language is the language. And you should be speaking my language. What does this have to do with da'wah? Sheikh said that he was at a conference in the UK. And then it was question and answer time. So a young man put his hand up. He said, Sheikh, I have a question. Why can't we eat pork in Islam? Why can't we eat pork? So before he could answer, the organizer, he said, let me answer this question. And he grabbed the microphone. He said, why is it that you didn't put your hand up? Why didn't you put your hand up and ask, Sheikh, why can't we eat dogs in Islam? You know why? Because British people don't eat dogs. That's why. He lives amongst a majority that doesn't eat dog. So he never wakes up and think, thinks to himself, why can't I eat dogs? Just look at that one. Look, mm, mm. I get some chili and ketchup with that thing. Mm. Why doesn't he say that to himself every day? You never wake up in the UK and ask yourself, why can't I have a dog for breakfast? Hot dog is different. I want a real dog. Huh? You know why? Because British people don't eat dogs. But British people eat pigs. They eat pork. They eat bacon and all that stuff. So he starts to question his own values and say, why can't we do what the majority does? Now he's questioning himself. But he never one day asked, why can't I eat mouse and rat and all that stuff? Because they don't. So you start to question your own values because the values of the majority become the norm. That's what's normal now. And that's what the sheikh told him. Why didn't you ask, why can't, you, why can't we eat dog? But I'm sure if he lived in certain countries, 
We're not going to mention where they are. <laughs> At that conference, he might say, hey, why can't we eat dogs? Yeah? Anyways, so this is what happens. It's called ethnocentrism. I'll give you another da'wah, a quick da'wah point here. When any time in America someone asks me, why did your prophet marry a young girl? What they're really doing is they're saying, our society, our culture, which is the best, said the number 18 is the best age. So they're saying, why didn't your prophet from 1,400 plus years ago follow what our society today said is the magical age, 18? You see what he's doing? That's all it is. It's ethnocentrism. So I never answer by, oh, well, you know, it was accepted. Here, here's the question. How old would you want her to be? 18. Is there any science that says 18 is the best age for marriage? It's the prime time for a woman to get married? No. Any study that says 18 is the best? No. Okay, how did you come up with 18? Really, the answer is, mm, our society said 18 is the best age. That's it. We're not based on any science or any study. Just our people said 18 is a good age. So why didn't you people follow what our society said? You know what? It's not even your society. It's recent society that said 18 is the best age. In 1901, 1905 in America, statesmen would marry girls who were 9 and 11. Queens of England were 13 and married. And so it wasn't even, it's a, a recent thing that 18 became the magical age. So you get people to understand, you're questioning the actions of my prophet not because they're wrong, because you think everybody has to follow what your current culture said is okay. Ethnocentrism, yeah? And it applies to many other aspects of da'wah. I just don't want to go into them. It's not a, it's not a da'wah talk. So we're, we've, we've seen now already that there are certain options you have as a minority living amongst a majority. We've seen now that there is pressure upon the Muslim, the believers, to conform, to act and to be like everybody else. To take the values of everyone, even the values that go against Islam, this pressure. And this pressure is what causes the difficulty of being different. Being different is not easy. You stand out. You dress differently, you stand out. Yeah? And, and for example, in America, if I dress like this and I go into the train station, I stand out. It's not like everyone's dressed like this. And in America, people will stare, but they're experts at staring. You understand? Like, they don't stare at you like this. They, they, when they see you, like, oh, it's normal. <laughs> I, I accept. <laughs> then when you pass, you're like. I used to live in a country. I'm not going to give names. In this country, people stare. La ilaha illallah, the way they stare. They stare. So they have PhDs in staring. <laughs> so I know this is a side note. But you know how when you, if someone is staring at you, even if you can't see them, you feel something burning into you, right? If there's someone here staring at me, I feel like something's burning me here. I turn around, there's a guy like this. Like we'd be waiting for our parents in the car and you feel something burning into you. You turn and there's a guy staring at you. I'm not going to exaggerate just like this. Now usually when you turn and look at someone right in the eye, what do they do? They look away, huh? But in that country, they, he keeps staring right back at you. So the two of you are just staring at each other like this. <laughs> then we'd get frustrated and we do this. And the guy does this. Anyways, but you know, when you're different, people stare. You dress differently, people stare. If I wear this, people will stare. But sometimes I wear jeans and a t-shirt and maybe nobody stares. But sisters, you, you don't have that. All the time, you're dressed differently. All the time, you stand out. And there is a degree of difficulty that comes with that. And Islam recognized that difficulty. And the Prophet ﷺ recognized that difficulty. And that's why the hadith that we've been hearing and we'll continue to hear throughout the conference about being strangers, about being ghuraba, were mentioned. It's to give people like us support, to give us courage so we can withstand that. Because it is difficult to be different. And the Prophet ﷺ said, بَدَأَ الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا كَمَا بَدَأ Islam started out as something strange. And it's going to return to be something strange just as it started. Fatuba lil ghuraba. Glad tidings to those who are different. So who are those who are different? And there are a number of explanations. One of them is that, is that people who are, who are basically, they remain uh, righteous amongst a majority that's not righteous. Yeah? People who behave right and believe in Allah and do all the things in a majority that's not like that. Different. So there's a difficulty of being different because as humans, we want to conform. We want to agree. We want to be like everyone else. We're social beings. But now I'm different. 
and I stand out and there's difficulty involved with that. And because there's difficulty, you have to withstand it and remain strong. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in a hadith, he mentions to his companions that there will be ahead of you, meaning in the future, there will be days of patience that require patience. And if days are days of patience, that means there's difficulty. So t difficulty, you need to be patient. And the reward of the believers at that time will be like the reward of 50 of one of you. Yani he's saying, he's talking about people, the later generations, like in our times, if you're patient in these difficult days, you will get the reward like that of 50 of the companions. It doesn't make you better, but the reward because it's so difficult. Now all these hadith are there for us, so we learn this concept of being strong, being patient, being courageous, withstanding this difficulty, not conforming. And this is what happens when people start to lose their identity very quickly. No, the attitude we learn is that we need to be strong. And we learn this from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. That's his life. That's what the companions went through. Look at the Meccan era. Difficulty, patient, withstand. Difficulty, patient, withstand. It's not difficulty, okay, here we go. Drop it. This is what happened after 9-11. Yeah. Brother, before 9-11, his beard's down to here. Yeah? Fantastic beard. 9-12? <laughs> uh -huh. He's like the guy in the Gillette commercial. Ah, that guy. <laughs> you know? Um, there's a lady, she wrote about, uh, she, used to, she used to work at this office building. It's an American lady. She said, for years, I would see this Muslim woman who works in another floor. And sometimes we take the elevator together. She's always dressed in full hijab. After 9-11, I saw her. Short skirt. Explosion of uh, colors on her face. Her hair standing like this. But did you have to go all that? And he could have just also still covered up well. So she, she said, I, the first time I ever spoke to her, I asked her, so you look different today. Why did you change your dress code? She said, I'm afraid people will attack me. If she read the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, if she knew Islamic history, this is our life. Yeah? This is our life. We do, we please Allah Azza wa Jal. If other people find that distasteful and they make our life difficult, we stay firm. We stay patient. We don't immediately get rid of things. That's why after 9-11, beards flew out the window, hijab flew out the window. People changed their names. Whoever was Muhammad became Mo. Whoever was Bilal became Bill. And Hassan Ali Abdul Ghafoor became Jackson. <laughs> so, <laughs> where is the attitude of standing firm and every, just overnight? Huh? The largest masjid in our area canceled Juma ah after 9-11. The largest masjid in our area canceled it. Pe Muslims made life difficult for Muslims. Brother, shave your beard. Brother, do this. Remove this. Change your name. Doesn't help. It's too late. The neighborhood saw you with your beard up to here. If you shave it, they still remember you as the guy who had the beard up. Now you're just the guy who used to have the beard up to here. You'll never become another guy. Uh, I'll tell you something. The Prophet ﷺ, he, he, he was teaching us this attitude of being strong, like the rock against the waves. Huh? Stand firm like that. When one day he was in the courtyard of the Kaaba, he's laying down. And the companions came to him. And which companions? Companions that were tortured. Severe torture. Like Khabbab radiallahu anhu. They made him ride, lay down on red hot stones. And the eyewitnesses says the only thing that put out these stones was the fat from his back melting and putting out the stones. These types of people. And they came to the Prophet Did they complain? No. What did they say? Ala tad'u lana. That's all they're saying. No complaint. Ya Rasulullah, look what they did to me. Not, nobody was complaining. Would you not make dua for us, Ya Rasulullah? Will you not ask for victory for us, Ya Rasulullah? That's it. And the Prophet ﷺ sat up. Sat up, yeah? And he told them about nations before. And how they used to torture the nations before. That they would bring a man and they'd dig a hole in the ground and put him in it. And then they would start to cut him, saw him in half. Can you imagine what that's like? They put the saw here on your head and it starts to cut through your skin and now it's starting to touch the bone of your skull and you can hear it really loud. And they're cutting you. Now it's touching your brain. And they cut them all the way in half. And they, I know, sorry for the graphics, but look at what people would stood before us. And they would bring a man and they would bring a metal rake and they would latch it onto his skin and his, his muscle and flesh and tear it off from the bone. 
like that. And that would, the Prophet said, that would not cause them to turn away from their religion. But you are a people who are impatient. You hasten. You're impatient. Allahu Akbar. Khabbab is impatient. These companions are impatient. And all they said was, let's just make dua for us for victory. But these things are to teach us, the later generations, patience, being strong. Not the slightest amount of pressure. Why do you do this? Why do you wear that? Why is your beard like that? And immediately, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, give me the shaver. I'll shave it. No. I don't want to repeat this story, but a guy at work asked me why I grow my beard. I asked him why he shaves his. That's it. Don't ask me why I grow. It's natural for me to grow my beard. Actually, I don't grow it. It comes out by itself. Right? I don't put manure and wake up every morning, huh? Something happening. It just comes out by itself. So what's unnatural is, is for you to remove it every morning and cut yourself in the process and put cologne and scream and all that stuff. You know something? The pressure of being different now, we're in a day and age, it's not even from non-Muslims pressuring Muslims to conform. It's Muslims pressuring each other. Because those who are upon the Sunnah now, and there's some of the scholars like uh, Imam Al-Awza'i, he said that it's not that Islam will disappear or anything, but it's the people following the Sunnah will be few. These will be the strangers. So now look at when people follow the Sunnah, what happens to them. Even within Muslim families, how they make fun of them. Or a, a, a girl will want to put on her hijab and her parents are the ones who oppose her the most. Or a girl goes to her school in niqab and the school, Muslim school, will oppose that. Or people have the aqeedah of Ahlul Sunnah al-Jama'ah that was taught to us by the Prophet And people oppose that. And the akhlaq of the believers becomes a rare thing. Go to some countries now, Muslim countries. And you'll be so disappointed at the mannerisms, uh, uh, how people deal with each other, how people speak with each other. Very disappointing. And then you have the few. Anytime, in any hadith, in anything, when you hear about few in any ayah, few are like that, you want to become from that group, true or false. Anytime. And pay attention from now on. Anytime a hadith that says, few people do this, make sure you're from the few. Allah says, وَقَلِيلُ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورُ Few of my servants are truly thankful. You tell yourself, I want to be from those few. Put effort to be from the rare people. Not like just the commoners. So the ghuraba are those few who have the proper belief, proper following of the sunnah, proper mannerisms. Even if everyone else is corrupt, they remain upon that. They remain upon that. That's what's one of the other explanations, by the way. It's, that the, it's the few who repaint, remain upon the truth at a time when the majority are not upon the truth. Okay. So now what do we have? We have the options that you're faced with when you're a minority living amongst a majority. We explained why it's difficult, why there's pressure on someone to conform because we're social beings, because the way of the majority appears to be the, the proper and the good way and the better way. And then we explained that it's difficult to be different. And that's why the Prophet in the, in the hadith and in the seerah and other places taught us this idea of being strong, not immediately breaking and collapsing. So the question then is, how do you see yourself? You know, they tell you the first way to control a people, to control a group, is to control how they see themselves. Yeah? This is a very serious issue. The first way to control a people is to control how they see themselves. How do I see myself? Do I see myself in a positive light? Do I see myself as a productive, mem productive member of community, of the community or society? Or do I just see myself as, you know, in the lower rungs of society? If you can manage to make me see myself down here, I'll never come up here. I'll always stay down here. Always. Again, I don't want to use too many American examples. But for example, if you ask um, specifically, there's some studies done with African-American youth. If you ask a classroom of African-American students, who wants to be an athlete? And most of them will put their hands up. Football player, basketball player, this, this and that. Hands will go up. Huh? Who wants to be a rapper? Huh? Hands will go up. Who wants to become a lawyer? Who's to become a doctor? One guy, and he's ashamed of it too. Yeah? Now the truth is, statistically, there are more African-American doctors and lawyers than all in the entertainment industry combined. Then more, more than, yeah, there are more African-American lawyers and doctors than there are African-American athletes in all fields of sports and rappers and actors and all that. But if I can control you to just want to go into that field and have no impact in the other fields, then I've won. So the question is, how do we see ourselves? Do we see ourselves 
as terrorists? Do we accept that or do we reject that? Yeah, I know. We'll all say we reject it. It's no secret when I go to America, I'm stopped at the airport. Yeah. And then I'm, they search my bag. Where have you been? Well, what were you doing all this time? Yeah. They don't ask any other guy. White guy comes in like, hey, welcome back, sir. Welcome home. <laughs> I come, why did you leave? Come here. Yeah. Now, so I didn't like that. So I went to a lawyer. Is there anything we can do about this? And you know what? The, the, it was a Muslim lawyer. You know what he told me? He told me to accept it. He told me to accept it. This is defeat. When, when I say, yeah, well, you know, the 19 people who started 9-11, they were from our people. And therefore, if they stop people like me at the airport, it makes sense. So I'm going to be quiet and let them trample and walk all over me. Accept it. The lawyer is telling me, accept it. This is the problem. How do we see ourselves? It's true we don't see ourselves as bad people. But at the same time, we accept that when we're treated like that. Yeah? You know, um, so that brings us to how does the world see you? How does the world see you? If any of you studied PR, public relations, you understand that if you, let's say, as a company, as an organization, as a school, you have to first tell people who you are. That's how people will know you. But if you don't tell people who you are, and someone else publicly says who you're not, that label will stick on you no matter what. And you'll have to put 10 times more effort to fix that label, to undo that picture. 10 times more effort. It's smarter and easier to come up from the beginning and say, this is who we are. But most people don't do that. And someone else says, that's who they are. And now, no, 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 it's not true. Nobody's listening to you anymore. You've gotten that label. So... How the world sees us is a very big deal. How we're seen in the media is a very big deal. And what's our response? What do we say? What happens when we're depicted a certain way is a very big deal. And typically, for now, for the most part, we don't do much about that. We don't do much about that. And I know Sheikh Abdul Bari brought up earlier when other groups are attacked, how they react. In America, you can't say a word about the Jews because they know how to act properly here. And immediately, you're an anti Semite. You can't say anything about the Jews. You say things about Muslims, huh, where are they? They're busy somewhere else eating kebab, biryani, whatever they're doing. Nobody does anything about that. You know, I had um, part of my, my field of study is media production. And I had a professor. He said something very interesting. He said, if you look at all the movies, all the older American movies, the bad guy has what accent? Huh? Who watches movies now? No, no, older movies. The bad guy has what accent? Russian accent or who will get this other one? Thank you. German. The bad guy always had a German accent or a Russian accent. And I don't want to give you names of movies, but you think to yourself, not Hong Kong Hollywood movies, yeah? Hong Kong movies, though, they have a different accent. But here, the bad guy always had the German accent because this is the effect of the wor World War, yeah? And it affected a lot of things. World War II affected a lot of things in America, even the names of food. The hot dog, it used to be known as a Frankfurter, but it's a German name. World War II, they changed it to the hot dog. We don't want a German name anymore. We had this issue with the Germans. It still stayed in the minds of Hollywood producers. And even we tried to do some stupid things like that after uh, where France refused to invade Iraq and Afghanistan and all that. We, this, we came up with this whole we hate France thing. And... Uh, even George Bush, you know the French fries, right? He said, I, I call them freedom fries. Not <laughs> That's George Bush, I'm sorry. He said, we're going to call them freedom fries, not French fries, because we don't like the French. Of course, we all know it's no secret that George Bush was a complete idiot. And the word French in English, it was a verb. To French means to cut into strips. They were called French fries because they were cut into strips, not because it came from Paris. But when you have an idiot as a president, what can you do? <laughs> yeah. So, so the point is that the professor said, now, this was after 9-11. He said, now you will notice that bad guys from now on moving forward are going to have Arab accents. And you're nodding because you all realize that you've seen that. The bad guy is the Arab guy. Yeah. And that's, that's the new bad guy. How, what is it going to take for us to undo that? Allah Ta'ala A'lam. The Germans have been friends and they've been producing wonderful cars to the Americans for how long? And they were always the bad guys in the movies. How are we ever going to remove that? Well, I one time I'm working on my laptop and the TV is on. 
and I heard there was a standoff, like, you know, this guy with his gun behind the wall, the other guy with his gun, and they're talking to each other. And one guy had an Arab accent, so I stopped work to see what this Arab guy looks like. And when he surrendered and he came out from behind the wall, he wasn't even Arab, he was African. They give an Arab accent. That's the new bad guy. Okay, just a side story, but this is a true story that happened after 9-11. I used to work in Washington, D.C. in an office, and the head of security came... <laughs> This is, has nothing to do with the lecture. It's just a funny story, okay? Actually, it does have something to do with the lecture. You'll see. So this head of security of the building, he comes to us. He comes to our office because it was an Islamic radio station. He sees all the women in hijab and all the brothers with beards. So the head of security comes to the office. Uh, does anybody in here speak Islamic? <laughs> I said, do you mean Arabic? There's no such language as Islamic. So he felt stupid. I don't know what language it is, but we just need somebody to translate something. So, okay, I'll go with you. So basically what happened, they thought that they discovered something great. One of the ladies in the other floors, in the other buildings, someone called her office phone over the weekend by accident and left a voicemail there. So in Arabic. So now she thought maybe it's two terrorists making, leaving voicemail in the wrong place. I will tell the FBI I'll be a hero on CNN. Yes, uh, I came in the office and I found the voicemail. <laughs> She'll be a, super, you know, <laughs> a hero now, right? Heroine. So I went to the office and when I got to the office, the translator is here. Everybody's standing all serious. Oh, we intercepted the message from a possible terrorist organization. And I went and they played the voicemail for me. It was an African guy speaking in English. The guy's like, I am standing right here, my brother. <laughs> that's, that's all it was. It was an African, thick, <laughs> thick English, thick African accent speaking English. I heard it. I looked at them. I was like, this is English. It's just a guy lost in the street. <laughs> One sheikh told me, you should have told him, actually, this message isn't Christian. It's not in Islamic. <laughs> oh, man, oh, man. <laughs> Okay, let me close with who you are, right? Not how people see you, not how you see yourself. Let me close with who you really are and how people should see you. Number one, you are someone who's going to guide everybody else. Guide them to Jannah. Not guide them to a good investment here or a good automobile to buy or a place to live. You're going to guide people. You're a guide. You're the only ones alive on this planet who have the religion of truth. Just knowing this, there is no way I can see myself beneath you. It's impossible. How on earth will I know the way to a Jannah and someone who has no clue what a Jannah is, is going to make me feel that I'm less than them. Allah, you can try as hard as you want. You're never going to make me feel less than you. Allah Azawajal chose me to be a Muslim, someone who knows the way to paradise, eternal paradise. And to have the ingredients to stop you from going into the hellfire. And I'm supposed to see some guy who has no clue about anything on earth. Am I supposed to feel this person is superior to me? Absolutely not. So number one, you're one who guides others to the truth. And there's no way that you are a guide and an educator and see yourself as having the lower hand and the lower position. No way. So number one, you're a guide to humanity. And that's your job. That was the job of your prophet. And by extension, it's your job. And that was the way and the life of the Prophet ﷺ. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعْنِي Say, هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي Say, this is my way. So the Prophet ﷺ then is to say, this is my way. I call to Allah. What does this mean? One explanation, it means Islam. This is my way. Islam is my way. And I call people and I call to Allah. And those who follow me also do the same thing. The other explanation, what does this mean? هَذِهِ سَبِيلِ It means, da'wah is my way. So it's like the Prophet is saying, da'wah is my life, and I call people to, to Islam. And it's also the way of my followers, those who follow me. This is our life. We're educators. We're guides. So number one, we're guides. Number two, we're educators. Islam has solutions for all kinds of problems in this world. So we're supposed to be people who offer these fantastic solutions. You know when... Uh, the, there was a recession not long ago in America and the housing market crashed and everything. Every Muslim kept saying, if only they would have followed the Islamic system, this wouldn't happen. And now they will see that the Islamic system is the best system. What does that say about you? Huh? What does that say about 7 or 10 million Muslims living in America who have the perfect system, but they're keeping quiet about it? 
And then when it collapses, you tell them, I had a system all along that was much better than this one. And now that yours is collapsed, you see that yours is no good. And imagine you are with a group, yeah? And there's what, whatever, there was an accident or something and you need to stop the bleeding. And then the guy just lets you try all kinds of things. You're not a doctor. You're trying all kinds of weird things, putting scotch tape and electric tape on the wound. Nothing worked. The guy dies. He bleeds out. He dies. Then you tell him, I studied medicine. And I know the way to do You should have done it this way. And I know that. But I, just, I was just letting you fail first. I just let you, so you know. Yeah. What would you tell this person? What kind of a human being are you? You're sitting there watching me make mistakes all this time. And then when it's too late, tell me I had the better system. So we're educators, people. We're educators. We don't sit here with, oh, we have the solution for everything. We have the orphanages, you know, children out of wedlock, venereal diseases. We've got the solution in Islam. But we're just keeping it. We're not going to share it with everybody. We know how to get people off of drug addiction. We know how to get solve all these kinds of problems. But we're not going to share it with you. What kind of person are you then? We're educators. We're educators. And we come with our solutions immediately and we help. And that's why it brings me to my third and last point, which is we, are, we should be a blessing to our community. When the Muslims come into town, what a blessing that is for everyone else. And everybody feels that way. Yeah, when Muslims come into a city or come to a neighborhood, the, the non-Muslims should say, the Muslims are here. This is great. But they don't. When the Muslims move in, like the Muslims are here, let's get out. Why? We don't have this fantastic impact on people. Allah says in the Quran, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ you're the best nation ever brought forth for an nas And you know what an nas means in the Quran? It doesn't mean the believers. It means everybody, Muslims and non-Muslims. So you're the best ummah brought forth for humanity. Why? Because you enjoin what is good and you forbid what's evil. That's what makes us excellent and superb. That's why when we come into a community, we're going to fix everything, every problem in it. But we don't do that with certain exceptions. I can th think of only maybe two communities or neighborhoods in America where it was a very dangerous neighborhood. You could not even drive your car there without getting killed. And now the Muslims moved in, built a masjid and everything and cleaned it up. No drugs being sold, nothing. But that should be the effect everywhere. But now when Muslims come, people are disappointed. There is a masjid, I'm not going to say which state in America, but there's an Islamic center in a very rich neighborhood. A very, very clean, very organized, rich neighborhood. Every Friday after Jum'ah, it looks like a hurricane hit that neighborhood. Because that masjid, they give food for everybody. Hundreds of people. Every Friday, they give out food for free. So what do you find in that clean, nice neighborhood? Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Thursday, clean neighborhood. Friday, it looks like a hurricane, a tornado hit the city. Why? Pla paper plates here, chicken bones over there. Rice all over the place in the street. And the guy's just eating ah, rice on the... <laughs> you can see the rice follow it from the guy's uh, car all the way to the masjid. From the masjid to his car. Chicken bones, rice. Okay. Here's the plate. <laughs> it's like a crime scene, okay? This is where he threw the bone. So now, you think people are going to be happy? Oh, the Muslims are moving into a neighborhood. Oh, no. Let's move. Quit sell the house now before the property value goes down. Unfortunately... You know, there was a masjid that was going to be built in one, um, one neighborhood in America. So the, the non-Muslims said, we don't want a mosque here. Traffic and double parking. and yeah, We don't want it. So they took it to the city council. And they had a meeting. And one uncle got up, Muslim uncle got up, to give reasons why we should build a masjid here. He said, we have the right to build a masjid here. A mosque. Because we have been part of this community for 25 years. He thought it was a great speech. A woman got up, non-Muslim woman, and she was genuine. She got up shocked. She said, you guys have been here for 25 years? I have been doing soup kitchen. You know, when you give soup to the poor and all that every, whatever, Saturday, give food to the poor. She said, I've been doing soup kitchen for 20 years. Not once have I seen a Muslim helping out or giving or doing anything to this community. She's saying, where were you? You just hide. And for many years, and alhamdulillah, this has changed now. Muslim communities would be just hiding like that. And I'm saying this so uh, and you know better what happens in Hong Kong. So if the, you're in the same situation, you change it. 
But for many years in Islam, any good that came out of the community went back to the community. It never reached anyone else. So when we help the poor people, we help the Muslim poor. When we feed, we feed the Muslim poor. No one else feels the effect of being around Muslims. We don't help anybody else. But that's really not the way of the believers. It's not. The believers, the good that comes out of them is felt immediately and is felt by everybody in the community. And one of the best examples of this is that of uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah and he basically he when he died when he died it was a, his death was a, a big deal schools closed markets and stores closed and people were crying and saddened but a Christian man a priest came crying that ibn Taymiyyah died a Christian man was crying and the Christian man should not cry because ibn Taymiyyah wrote volumes refuting Christianity so he should be very happy that he died. But he came crying. And people asked him, why are you crying? This is a Muslim leader who cried, what, uh, who died. Why do you care? And he said, I'm not crying because the man died. I'm crying because all the good that he used to do, no one's going to do it anymore. This is the believer. It's unbelievable. This is the believer that they do so much good. It affects Muslims, non-Muslims. Khair comes out of them, oozing out of them, affecting the whole community. That when they die, people will say, who's going to do the good work they used to do? That's, that's how we should be. That's how we should be. But today, closed cocoon, very little good goes out to the community. Muslims move in, alhamdulillah, that's great the Muslims have come. Now the drug dealers will stop. Now the, the liquor store will be sold and it will be something else. There will be less crime here because the Muslims are here. Everyone should be happy and everyone should feel the effect. We actually have speakers who go around the world telling Muslims that if non-Muslims are doing drugs, it's not your business. It's halal for them. If they're drink, if drinking alcohol, it's also halal for them. Don't tell them, don't try to stop the liquor store and close it and, and fix up the community and remove the drug dealers. What kind of attitude is this? How is that possible? You're telling me that I live in a country and it's my country and there's a drug dealer down the road and my well, children will go to and from school on the school bus and they'll meet him and he'll try to sell to them and that's not my business to tell him to stop because it's halal for him to sell drugs? Who said it's halal for him to sell drugs? No. Where do you see in the Bible, thou shall sell, thou shall sell crack? Yeah. Where have you seen that? It's not halal for him to sell. So, it's a wrong attitude. Wrong attitude that we don't do anything, it's okay, just let it happen. No, the khair comes out of us and it affects everybody. And everybody is happy that the Muslims have come to town. Not the opposite, which is what is happening now. Uh, and that's why one of the explanations of what it means, ghuraba, to be strangers. One explanation is that those people who are righteous, when everyone else is the opposite. So those who are, remain upon the truth, everyone else is upon a type of falsehood. Or... The other explanation is that it's those who correct the, the false, I mean basically uh, whatever, whatever wrongdoings the others do, they correct that. That's their job. People who correct and fix what's wrong with society. It's not enough to be a gharib, meaning that you know, I'm upon the truth and everyone else is upon falsehood and I will remain strong. The, the scholars say that's the, the lower position, yani of, the lower explanation of ghuraba. The lowest explanation, that I'm a gharib, everyone else is corrupt, I'm righteous, I pray and everything, and I remain firm. That's the low explanation. The higher explanation of that is that people are corrupt and I'm fixing things. That's who we are. People are corrupt, things are wrong, and we fix things. That's our position. We're guides, we're educators. We're people who are a blessing to our community. This is how we should see ourselves. Always see yourself as a guide. See yourself as an educator. See yourself as a blessing for the community. And that way, you will never see yourself in the lower position. Or that, oh, look how they're looking at me and you know, I wish I, I could be like that or dressed like that. I wish I could disappear and not be noticeable. No, that's the way of the believers. And this is also mentioned in the Quran. It's in the seerah. It's in the sunnah. قال الله عز وجل إن الذين أجرموا كانوا من الذين آمنوا يضحكون so those who basically, those who disbelieved or transgressed, they would laugh at the believers. Why? Because that's the way. That's just the sunnah of Allah on earth. You're, if you're laughed at, be happy. If you're laughed at, be happy. That's, that's the history of this deen. You're upon the truth. The truth looks strange to someone else. So they laugh at you. 
Don't worry about it. Everybody, they might, they might make fun of you. They might make fun of your beard. They might make fun of your hijab. They might ask you, why don't you date? Are you gay? This happens all the time in America. Someone doesn't have a girlfriend. Are you gay? Make fun of you all the time. So they'll make fun of you, but there will be a day when they will wish that they were just like you. They will wish they were just like you. And we're talking about when death comes. We're talking about on the day of judgment. They'll make fun of you, but there will be a day when they will wish that they were like you. The woman who's not covered and making fun of you. Aren't you hot? It's hot today. Shouldn't you take that off? She will wish one day that she was like that woman who is well covered. She will, they will wish like they were praying like that guy that they made fun of. So this is who we are. And if we always see ourselves in this light, it doesn't matter how we're depicted anywhere else. It doesn't matter who tries to put you down. There's no way you can be put down. If I'm an educator, the educator always has the upper hand. If you're a guide, the, the one who doesn't know, there's no way he can be equated to the one who knows. So there's no way you can see yourself less than anyone else. With that, I think we've come to the end. So what did we learn here? We learned a number of things. That it's natural to feel pressure from being different. We're social beings. And the society wants you to conform. And you as a social being want to conform as well. Because it's difficult to be different. And because it's difficult to be different, we have words of encouragement. And ayat of encouragement from the Quran and from the Sunnah telling us, this is the history of Islam. People tortured, people punished, and they remain strong. Like a rock against the waves crashing against it. So we have this attitude. Not the, okay, let me get rid of this value. No, we have the attitude of let me stand strong for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And then see yourself as guides, as educators, as blessings to the community. Khair comes out of you and you're always teaching. You're teaching those younger than you, those around you, your neighbors. The influence is tremendous. So just like Sheikh Abdul Bari said, then when the guy goes and hears something on the television, he says, that's not what I've seen from the Muslims. That's not what I know of Muslims. And it won't matter what people are saying at that point. So with that, I would like to thank you for being an attentive audience. Sallallahu wa barakatuh.